The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development. With a magazine and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives, at The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Hey everyone, it's Bernardo Moya here, founder of The Best You, author of The Question, and I'm very, very excited today uh, to have my friend uh, Jason Vale, the Juice Master here. Hey Jason, how are you? I'm I'm good. Yeah, really good today. Yeah, thank you. I'm joining you from, uh, uh, I was going to say sunny Spain, but it's not so sunny today, oddly. But yes, anyway, lovely to uh, chat to you and be on. Thank you. Thank you. So look, uh, for those of you that don't know who Jason is, well, my first question is, where have you been? Uh, but this man is, is for me, he's, he's, he's the real deal. He's an author, he's a speaker, he's a filmmaker. And uh, his books have sold more than 5 million copies uh, all around the topic, obviously, mainly around juicing and, and being healthy and, and living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I want to talk about that and obviously creating some many successful apps, uh, I don't know how many he has. I'll have to ask him. Last time I checked, he was on around 11. They're all best-selling. But he has a very solid brand. Uh, he does these amazing five-star retreats, which are just beautiful. And, 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 and I've had the pleasure and honor of Jason not only collaborating, working, partnering, but helping, uh, you know, the Best You Expo over the years. And he's a real deal. Jason, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you. That's right. Thanks. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for that intro. That was, that was some intro. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, so Jason, um, I, I wanna. I always like him telling you know my, my listeners a little bit more about you know how it all started and, and your early years. So, tell me a little bit more about where you were born and kind of like you know what were you like at school? Were you trouble? You know, what did you like doing? Well, I don't know. I never went to school, so that could be difficult to find out what I was like at school, Bernardo, to be honest with you. By the way, this is not uh, any advice for people to not go to school. Um, to cut a long story incredibly short, because sometimes going into somebody's history is, 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 uh, uh, can be often uh, uh, boring for some people. Um, I was brought up one parent family. There was just me and my mum. Uh, my dad was never around. I only met him twice in my entire life. Um, we grew up, uh, and there was no brothers, no sisters, just me and her. We uh, grew up, in fact, Actually, when I was seven, we were on the streets, genuinely. That's not an exaggerated story at all. We were genuinely on the streets. She was trying to find us a home. We ended up living uh, in a squat. Um, a squat, for those that don't know, is somewhere where you actually break into a derelict building, essentially, try and get the electric and gas on, and uh, then try and make a life for yourself until you are effectively thrown out. Uh, we even moved to Africa when I was 11, went to Togoland on several promises that she had. Unfortunately, they didn't transpire, and we ended up living in a mud hut, and then couldn't actually come home, and all kinds of stuff happened. But uh, So that was that was the kind of the, 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 the journey. This wasn't a bad childhood, by the way, at all. I mean, for pe- people often for some reason, link, I don't know, lack of opportunity or lack of money to a bad childhood. A good childhood is if you've got one solid person that is your foundation that loves you and cherishes you and takes care of you, you've had a phenomenal uh, childhood. I was very blessed from that point of view. Um, but we had some challenges, as most people do, but I don't think uh, they were detrimental at all. I think they 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 help you become the person that inevitably, in the end, uh, who you are. Um, I was... Look, I was like most teenagers as well. I mean, I, I drank heavily at the time, but I just continued after my teenage years. That was the challenge I had. Uh, I also smoked two, three packets of cigarettes a day. Uh, I was incredibly overweight, covered from head to foot in a skin disease called psoriasis. I mean, literally covered. I mean, 90% of my skin was covered. Uh, I had severe asthma, very bad eczema. Um, I was just, I was, I was in a bad way, um, in, in physically in that manner. I mean, I tried everything. I mean, in terms of, uh, just trying, you know, I, I didn't like school. I left school at 15. I had to, God, there's another story there. I could go on. I mean, I had to look after my mom. Anyway, that's another story there because she went into hospital with a cyst the size of an orange on one of her ovaries and they took out the wrong ovary. Genuine story. No, nope, not made up. Um, it is terrible, but I actually believe, Bernardo, genuinely, I'm not one to ever attack any... People always think I am. They think I attack the uh, the medical profession or doctors or... And I don't, far from it. I could never do their jobs. I think they're incredible human beings. And I also think we, we have the luxury, if you're in any other profession, you have the luxury of having a bad day at the office. And there's no... And, and, and I... 
honestly mean that I don't believe there's ever any intent at all. The vast, vast, vast majority of people who get into that business for whatever reason, they don't even call it a business, it's a vocation, do so because they genuinely, every part of their fiber wants to help people in some way. So the people that made a mistake bad day at the office and took out the wrong ovary in my mother's case. There was no intent there. I have no ill feeling or animosity towards them. They didn't deliberately wake up one day, I know what we'll do. We'll take out the wrong one because that's the kind of people we are. They would never, they don't do that. My mom obviously got, rightly so, got very angry about the mistake. It was a mistake, but very angry. So she was in bed for two years. Uh, effectively, I was looking after her. So I left school at 15. Uh, I lived in Southeast London in Peckham. Um, those that don't know London at all, Peckham, even those that say now that it's very gentrified and it's all changed. Um, I tell you now, it's, um, <laughs> it was, uh, to say it was rough. I mean, it's still rough now. I mean, it was equivalent to, I guess the Bronx in, in New York, I, I would, I would equate it to North Peckham estate has now been taken down. I mean, I was, uh, I mean, just growing up, I was mugged 14 times at knife point to give you some reference. I mean, it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 it was rough. I mean, to say, yeah. you know, to say, to, anyway, so, but I would travel from there to North London to a butcher shop, ironically, to where I, I used to work as a, uh, as a, well, I would say a butcher. My uncle would say I never was. Um, but essentially I would work there for, you know, eight pounds a day, come home and, you know, bring some eggs back to, to my mom and all that kind of stuff. So that, that, that's, that's where, and then I tried everything from, but from, you know, I, I was a builder. I was a, I say builder. I mean, I, I was a laborer. I mean, I worked down the markets. I worked in a tire shop in Brixton in Cold Arbor Lane. I, I mean, I don't know where to start. I mean, I was a painter and decorator. I mean, again, that, that's loose. I was a caterer. I mean, that was loose terms that you can never imagine. Um, and, it, and, and it just went on and on and on. And to be honest with you, I didn't really change my life until I was about 25, uh, which we'll come on to in a minute. But then I got, and then everything was taken away from me at the age of 30. So we can tap on some of those things, but that, that's a kind of, I was going to say brief background, but it is brief <laughs> compared to, because there, there's a million stories in each one of those. So, uh, well, obviously, in so many ways, I can only imagine your mum was an inspiration for you in, in so many ways and in, in being there and, 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 you know, doing what she did. Um, look, uh, a great story, Jason, great story, but that's, that's obviously marked you of who you are. And I, I think, you know, the most successful people out there, in my opinion, are those that have done many jobs in their life and, and, and fallen flat on their face a few times and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and had a, you know, relatively challenging uh, bringing, but you know, kudos to you. So, um, so obviously, then at the age of twenty-five, w- was that kind of like a turning point for you? Well, it's strange. I read a I read a book on stopping smoking. Weirdly, just that I know somebody. I, I mean, I was a, a heavy smoker, like I said. I mean, some people think that it's an exaggeration, but if you knew where we worked, I mean, literally 40, 60 cigarettes a day. I mean, the, the, that wasn't. <laughs> there was more at weekend. I used to buy 60, so you'd probably give away 20 throughout the day. So it was more like 40 or 50 uh, cigarettes a day, two, three packets a day. Uh, I've obviously managed to cut down over the years. Bernard, I know I only smoke after I've made love, so I'm still on 10 a day. Um, that was an old joke uh, back, <laughs> <laughs> back from 1984. Now, clearly I don't, I, I don't smoke anymore. But I read this book, and i tell you why it was a life-changing book for me. It's because it, contrary to the usual mantra that I used to tell myself and everybody backed it up. Smoking, stopping smoking is difficult. Stopping smoking is impossible. Stopping smoking is whatever it is. So I believed it because I tried many times and it was seemingly impossible. And then I read this book and at the end of this really short book that took me two hours to read, and bear in mind, I don't read. Even to this day, I don't read. I'm not a big, avid reader at all. I get headache. I'm massively dyslexic. I, I, I find reading a real chore. So the fact that I read this book was a miracle anyway. The only one I'd ever read since leaving school. And even at school, I read one book. So I mean, I didn't really get involved at school. I read this book. And at the end of it, I just didn't want to smoke. So I couldn't get my head around it. Like not only did I not want to smoke, and I wasn't under hypnosis, nothing occurred. I just read a very straightforward book, very logical, very straightforward, explaining the nature of effectively what is the nicotine trap. So it was just explaining it. It wasn't, it was done in very lay person's terms. And I was going around, and I was a heavy smoker. I mean, I smoked all kinds of dope and everything. I mean, I was in Peckham, I mean, for Christ's sake. I mean, we smoked everything. <laughs> and, and I just didn't want anything. I was just like, 
but I didn't suffer any withdrawal at all. I mean, zero, contrary to what everybody says, it's a physical addiction. And, and I couldn't get my head around it. So about eight months later, I did find myself weirdly um, smoking again because uh, I found myself just joints were going around and next thing you know, I took a joint and before you know where you are, once you know the nature of the beast, it actually gets you back very quickly. So I tried rereading the same book, but of course it didn't work the second time because it wasn't, it didn't work the second time. I didn't work the second time. That wasn't new information to me. I was like watching The Sixth Sense. You know, the first time you see the movie, well, it's brilliant because the whole premise is based on a reveal at the end that nobody knew. Um, if you haven't seen The Sixth Sense, you listen to this, don't let me spoil it for you, but he was dead all the way along. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you haven't seen it by now, I mean, what are you thinking? Um, anyway, so, so then I, I, I tried to, and then I went to this guy's clinic. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I managed to stop again eventually. And when I stopped, I knew it was forever. And then I thought, you know, I, I want to teach this to people. I just want to teach people that you don't need to smoke. It's easy to stop. And here are the pitfalls that I made even once I had found freedom so that you don't have to fall down those pitfalls again. So I moved from London to Birmingham. Now, at the time, that was, that was an even bigger move than it is today. I mean, Birmingham actually is a hidden gem, weirdly, in the UK. Jason, um, just, just sorry to interrupt you, because you're going to leave so many people intrigued. What was the book? I know which one it was. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was Alan Carr. Sorry, it was Alan Carr. It was, it was Alan Carr's book, uh, The Easy Way to Stop Smoking at the time. I mean, there's been several since. I think he's brought yeah. out four since he's passed away, which is a neat trick. Yeah. Um, but, but, but <laughs> still, really good. <laughs> but still, I mean, I mean that, that takes some doing. I mean, that, I'm, I'm hoping I could do the same. If I pass away, I'm going to bring out another four books out of nowhere. Yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but effectively, I ended up moving to Birmingham to run one of his uh, clinics. Well, in fact, he only had one. I mean, I knew him back in the early days to run one of his clinics. And so I did that for many years. And, um, and then actually it was through the process of uh, a long story short, it was why I ended up with nothing at the age of 30. <laughs> Uh, me and Alan made up before he passed away, but actually there's a history story there where actually things didn't go particularly well at one stage of both of our lives between us. And, um, and I ended up back in Peckham at the age of 30, painting and decorating again, <laughs> and absolutely had no money at all, and everything was uh, taken away from me. And at that point, that was the most pivotal moment, uh, really thinking, okay, because look, nobody wants to be anywhere at the age of 30 and effectively have nothing. Have, I'm, I'm talking about financially. I had my mom and this, I mean, I, so, so that's very different. But I mean, I had to have nothing. And I think it's, and I'm going to get chastised for this, I appreciate it. But I think if we have our honest heads on, for the vast majority of people, it does tend to be harder for a man if at the age of 30, they end up with, they, they feel they end up with nothing. There's a natural something that's built within us that we feel that we have to be protectors. And I know that this is across the board. And before anybody listening with any common sense will understand the premise of what I'm saying, rather mm. than just jumping on some kind of sexism thing. It isn't that at all. There are many women that feel exactly the same way as well. Um, however, for, for me personally, as a, as, as a man at the age of 30, with absolutely nothing, back to paint and decorating after I, I thought I'd got out of Peckham, it was devastating. And I mean devastating to the point where six months I was genuinely depressed. And I, and, and I never used that word ever. I was depressed as in, I never knew what depression was until that point. I knew you could feel down and have a bad day. I never knew real depression where you get really dark with your thoughts. I mean, I'm, I'm talking scary times. And then during that period, it was like, either as my uncle George used to say, either piss or get off the pot. You know, you've either got to make a decision one way. Are you going to get busy living or get busy dying as the Shawshank Redemption would teach us? And I thought, I've got to get busy. What am I going to do? What's the cost of not doing something? So I ended up writing a health book. I was really into health anyway, even when I had everything taken away from me. Somebody said, well, why don't you have a drink and smoke again? I said, I'm depressed enough as it is. Why would I want to, why would I want to go back to those things? It doesn't make any logical sense. Um, so despite the fact I was feeling so down, I never turned to those things again in the same way that I would never have turned to heroin or anything else. Um, but I was depressed. So I ended up writing this book, the first book, and, and there's another story there. But anyway, I ended up writing the book and getting it published. And I don't know, I suppose the rest is history. If you're interested in finding your true purpose... If you're interested in finding your legacy, if you're interested in growing, if you are sick and tired of reading books that don't help you, haven't helped you or are not helping you or attending courses and seminars that haven't really had an impact in your life, I invite you to read my book, The Question, 
Find your true purpose out now. For more information, go to www.thequestion.co. If you're interested in working with me, contributing, speaking at any of our many events, partnering or licensing The Best You, for more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. I, th- I think kind of what, what actually, I mean, it's an amazing, amazing story anyway, Jason, but, but what is it that got you into going down the juicing route? Because, you know, kind of, I, I, okay, you, we're talking about 20 odd years now, okay? Yes. Years. I, I don't know, kind of like, hey, well, the, guys, the, let's, have, let's have juices, you know, kind of like probably a lot of people looked at you kind of like, what, what is this guy on? Especially you with your energy and everything you've got, you know, what, 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 what is this all about? Because kind of like now, it's, it's obviously a lot of people get it, understand it. Hey, I've got to take care of myself. But it must have been kind of like... Listen, uh, Bernardo, I, nobody, under, nobody understood juicing back then. Not in yeah, the UK. I mean, yeah, there was a, a few, more, few more people in the US clearly that understood it. I mean, you know, you had people like Jay Cordich, who was the juice man, who passed away a few years ago. I had a good fortune of doing a seminar with him when I was 40, but um, he was, he was, he was just known as the, you know, as the juice man. You had Jack LaLanne in America, who was the godfather of fitness, but really got into juicing. But in the UK, not so much. Um, In fact, you can buy a juice extractor. In fact, you bought the, the kind of citrus presses, but they, they're not juice extractors, really. They're, they're just citrus presses. And um, so I had to go on the hunt to even find a juice extractor. Um, but my premise was, if you can't eat it, can you drink it? And, and this is the only reason why I got into juicing, Bernardo, is because I, I was thick physically, but not thick mentally. I knew that I needed fruits and vegetables. Look, I don't care how overweight, how sick you are, how anything you are, you don't need uh, a human doctor to tell you this. We have an intuitive doctor period. And our intuitive doctor tells us when we need to lean towards something. It's no coincidence when somebody's ill in hospital, most people intuitively bring them fruit. They did back in my days. There was an in, there's an intuitive thing to eat light, eat high water content foods, get plenty of fruits and veg, and it's there for our survival mechanism. That's what it is. We don't need somebody in particular to tell us what to have. So I wasn't stupid, but I hated vegetables, genuinely. And I don't really like them to this day, which surprises people. But when there's a choice of something else, why would you sit down and eat raw broccoli? Hats off to people that do. But really, do you enjoy it? Really? Seriously? But some people, but some people do, right? And hats off to them. And some people eat it because it's, it's, it's good for their immune system and so on. But I thought, if I can't eat it, can I drink it? And I found out that all fruits and vegetables are at least 84% high water content fuel. And it's only this fuel that ultimately feeds every cell in the body. I got really excited. And I started, you know, thinking, well, I'll just go in and buy some apple juice. And then I did some research and suddenly realized, well, that's been highly pasteurized. It's a a shadow of its former nutritional self that it once was, uh, because it's been blasted with heat. I mean, I've got a little, I'll tell you how much heat can destroy something. My little son, JJ, is only here because of cold, not heat. He was a little IVF baby, six rounds of IVF. He was a little IVF baby, call him a, a good egg. Some people say, oh, you can't put a price on the little ones. We can, 30 grand. He was an IVF, right? <laughs> but, 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 you remind him, Jason, you remind him. Oh, trust me, I will throughout my entire life. Uh, but, but the point is, he was frozen. He came from a frozen... So the point is, it was frozen and it retained every degree of life. If we play, applied any heat to that embryo whatsoever... He would not be here today, not at all. Now, this is a living thing. All fruits and vegetables are living things. When you apply it, a massive amount of heat. See, to us, we're just using words like pasteurized, processed. We don't really think about heat blasted. What have you actually done to the fabric, the, the nutritional fabric of that fruit or vegetable? And because humans are so arrogant and they go, oh, but we've analyzed it and we can still see that these vitamins exist and those minerals exist. And then you question them and say, there are trillions of cells in the human body. Is it not possible there are trillions of cells in an apple? Is it not possible just because you can name half a dozen things that man has effectively named that you now have the arrogance to believe you know every single cell of that apple and what's been destroyed in it? So this is why... I got into juicing. I thought, you know, I want the broccolis, which I hate eating. Like I'd eat an apple, I'd eat an orange, I'd eat, you know, fine. I like eating some fruits. I like avocados now. But actually, would I get the sheer volume of nutrition that is required? 10 portions are required every day, real portions, not five, not five a day, 10 a day. That's what's required to really reduce your risk of things like heart disease, cancers, and so on. This is what you need. You need 10 portions of fruits and vegetables a day, preferably in their live form, which is uncooked, unprocessed, unpasteurized. And most people aren't going to sit down and eat raw veg. And so if you can't eat it, can you drink it? And I have 
every single month without fail because it is my national health service. That's what it is. It is my own personal health insurance. So instead of me going, oh, they should do this or they should do that. No, I should be doing something. So what I do every morning is I up, I exercise, I get water and lemon, and I make sure I have a juice. Now, some days it can all go very pear-shaped after that. But I tell you, <laughs> but I tell you because I'm human like everybody else. However, that is my staple. The vast majority of the time I eat uh, uh, quite well anyway. Um, but there was a period for seven years that I was overly clean, but that's something else. But yeah, that's why I go into juicing. If you can't eat it, can you drink it? And most people take that premise on. And even if it's one, I, I, I say, do the 30 day challenge, just swap your breakfast for a green juice every single morning for 30 days, get into the habit, let, let it go. And then you'll never change it because you don't. Well, and that's kind of what I, I mean, you've created so many things. I mean, before I go into kind of all the things that you've created and, you know, the amazing challenges and your brand and everything else, because there's so much to talk to you about, but kind of what comes across having met you or seen you, but simply exploring kind of what you built is that obviously in, in, in a, how can I say this? you're very kind of like into the details of things. So kind of you've studied things, you know, so you, you, for me, it comes across like you became relatively obsessed in, in, in kind of this, because obviously you, you saw the impact it had in you, but then you just carried on creating and creating and creating and providing phenomenal skills. So would you say that you are kind of like, uh, I, I don't know, what's the word? I, I, Tenacious? What's the word? <laughs> well, no, it, it, it is tenacious, but it's also kind of like you know, it's it's around how how much you've insisted on on, on really exploring kind of the, the the advantage of juices and how you well you've presented it. So it's something that obviously you, you've done over the years. So what would you say is where, where does that come? Where's that creativity of yours? Come I from? think I think the main thing that drives me is the are other people. But the first when I first set out, the thing that inspired me was my own ill health. Once I couldn't believe the difference that not just juicing, but it's more about removing a lot of the rubbish coming into the body and replacing the deficiencies. And that's what juicing does phenomenally well. That doesn't mean that it's the only route to health because clearly it isn't. If somebody eats incredibly well all of the time and exercises, they may never need to juice. This is, but I've, what I've discovered was the vast majority of people actually, they don't. In fact, I sat down with one guy. In fact, one of the questions that I get asked the most is, well, why don't I just eat it? Right. This is the, one of the main things that people ask. And there was a guy who was 32 stone for those that are outside the UK and wondering what measurement that is. A stone, <laughs> so there are 14 pounds to a stone. All you need to know is 32 stone is huge, right? This guy, was huge. And he also had type 2 diabetes. He had gout. Yeah. I mean, you almost name a lifestyle ailment or disease and this poor individual had it. So I laid out all the fruit and veg that he was going to have juiced effectively for a whole month. And he said to me, well, why don't I just eat it? And my answer to him was very clear. I don't know. I said to him, I don't know why you don't, but you clearly don't. So we need to find another route. So those people that say, well, why don't I just eat it? And they're overweight and ill. I go, I don't know why you don't, but yeah. you don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so you should do. So if you don't eat it, then you should. So I was always trying to find ways to in, in, inspire people to say, look, all you've got to do is this for seven days. I knew what seven days could do. It seems to be the optimum. You come out of this thing after seven days, and as long as you keep to it to the letter, something crazy happens. Not only are you, and I know you should underplay and over deliver, but I don't care. I've been doing this for over 20 years. So I know this is a fact, right? You come out, you're mentally sharper by far. You also, you've dropped weight. You feel lighter clearly. But the key thing is it seems to reset the mind and body somehow. So you want a salad. It's the weirdest thing. You end up at the end of day, so a day eight, you can have whatever you want because you've finished the plan, job done, but you don't. For some reason, you want to eat well. You want lean proteins and good food and steamed vegetables. And, and you go, what? I don't get it. Now, then the other thing that inspired me was the, was the critics. I hate them. I don't hate being criticized because it's the only way to grow. What I hate is the ill-informed critics. What I hate are the headline readers, the keyboard warriors. And what I hate are the people that have no knowledge of this, never experienced it, never done it. And what they say is, oh, there's too much sugar. There's not enough fiber. Juicing's dangerous. This, that, to this day, and I've been doing it for years, and juicing's been around since the Vedic times, even to this day as we do this podcast, I tell you now, the amount of people that have direct, as a, as a direct tributation to juicing is still zero. It's still zero. So I don't know where the fears come from. 
Mm. I don't understand. I don't. And, and that's why and I'm it, on this mi- mission to say, look. Sorry, sorry. Got- no, I was, I was just going to say it just comes from the lack of understanding, lack of interest in learning and, and practicing. You know, that, that's well, the problem. practicing. It's the key, yeah. ones, the, the, the key thing there, Bernardo, is the very end one. Mm. It's the lack of practicing. Mm. If you try it on for science, because you can study anything, but the point is a lot of the books are wrong as well. I, so love, the point, the I, would, I love the keyboard warrior. Yes, there's lots there's of There's loads of keyboard war, warriors, but, I, but, but it's the lack of, it's not only just lack of understanding, because you can stay, look, you can be very proficient in studying, but if what you're studying is wrong, then it's a complete waste of time. Mm. So the, the point, so and that's why actually you say that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I, once I get my teeth in something, I just, I, I go after it. Um, and of course, I, I hate reading books in education, but I did absorb hundreds of health books because I, I suppose I had an interest in it. And somehow, all of a sudden, you know, it was easier to read because I suppose I was interested in it. But all the books contradicted one another, as they often do. Health and nutrition is a very uh, divisive subject. Um, it was more divisive than Brexit was, I think. <laughs> um, and people say you should eat protein and others say, no, you shouldn't, this, that and the other. The staples never go away, though. Fruits, vegetables, grains, nuts, seeds, and lean proteins. Don't mess with it, right? You just, these are the fundamentals. These are the, the and, and anybody who argues against it really genuinely don't know what they're talking about. And anybody who argue against juicing, they don't, they haven't experienced a well thought through juice or blend plant. That's what I would say. Well, Jason, I think kind of, and what I love is, is obviously what you've built around, not only the books, you know, where you've, you know, more than 5 million copies with all your different books translated into, into different languages and all the challenges, you know, these 30-day challenges where you've got people from all over the world, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on it uh, and, and seeing that the, the changes in people's lives is phenomenal. So the support that you provide, you know, not only with the books that you published, uh, but also with the apps that you, you then, uh, again, have provided. I've always seen you ahead of your game, in, 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 and, I, and I point out to you, to every person that I know, within the personal professional growth industry as, as, as a leader, because you, you have led the way so many years in advance. But, but not only that, is, is you're authentic, but, but the fact that you've created the or everything that anyone needs, you know, so it's not only you walk your talk, but you provided the tools and then you can, you continue to provide the support. And, and that's kind of where, again, you know, you, you've also, because I know you, you obviously went to, to do many other things. So your retreats was obviously something that you were very passionate about. So again, the reality of, of you being in Peckham at the age of 30 you know, with no money and then, you know, where you are today, I suppose you couldn't even picture it in your mind at that point. But I mean, you know, I suppose at some point you said, well, how cool would it be to have people coming over together where you could take care of them in these idyllic places? How did the whole idea of the retreats come around and, and how, well, the, the, how, how amazing is it for you? I can imagine. Well, it's borne out by other people, as always, most of the time. People just come to me and say, look, have you ever thought about doing a retreat? You know, because I'd love to follow your plan with you and this, that, and the other. That was many years ago. And I said, well, look, I'll, I'll have a bash, but we have no money, of course. So it was just like, well, how do you hire a place? What do you do? So we found a place in Turkey, middle of nowhere it was at the time, um, just to hire, had its own private island. Couldn't believe it. It was like, wow. Um, and at the time, that the, the airport in Dalaman, in particular in Turkey, was, was so antiquated. Um, but we found this place and I, I just put it online. I said, look, anybody want to join us for this? I've hired it. And I remember I had 15,000 pounds. That's all I had in my entire business account. <laughs> and, and we put, because people think once you, you, you write a book and get it out there, that must mean you're a millionaire overnight. Oh yeah. yes, that's exactly how it works. <laughs> anyway. And uh, so I, um, so I had 15,000 pounds and I put it all, every single penny uh, into hiring this place, which you couldn't hire it now for that. I think it's a hundred grand a week now to hire, um, but 15,000 pounds. And uh, you could have 40 people there. And so I put it out within four days, it sold out. It's still not making a profit, but at least it would cover my expenses. And at least I'd get the learning of how to run the retreat, which I didn't know. I mean, we landed two days before. And I remember having this yoga guy that I'd never, I met once in, in Ireland. Um, I said, hey, do you fancy doing this? He went, yeah, why not? I didn't know him. And then, and then there was my girlfriend at the time. And we, we there was just three of us. And, we, and every night we to go, right, they're arriving tomorrow. What are we going to, what's the plan? I went, I don't know. <laughs> so, 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 we, so, we, so we literally just went, right, why don't we do this in the morning? Because I always feel it's best, Bernardo, genuinely. Don't overthink things. There are no rules yeah. and do and do genuinely adapt to the surroundings at the time. In fact, actually, if we had tried to plan beforehand, 
it would never have worked because oh. we didn't know the lay of the land. We didn't know the island. We didn't know this. We didn't know what was available. We didn't, you know, I look at stuff. I, I'm like a kid. I get really excited, Bernardo, with just about everything, right? <laughs> so I look at this stuff and I go, man, we could do that there. We could do mini trampolining near the sea and just jump in it afterwards. We could do this. So the idea is that can you have a great time yourself at the same time as other people having a blast? Instead of white knuckle, because people go, I'm going on a detox. When I get through this, then I'll be happy. It's like, what? You're playing the I'll be happy when game. That's the first thing I teach on day one. Don't ever do the I'll be happy when game. If you say, I'll be happy when, I don't know, whatever you want to finish the sentence. I'll be happy when I lose the weight. I'll be happy when I get the six pack. I'll be happy when I get in the little black dress. I'll be happy when I get the car. I'll be happy when I write the book. I'll be happy when I do this. What you're saying is, I'll be miserable until these happen. That's what you're saying. Well, you're telling your brain, I will be miserable now until this happens because I've given a command to my brain that actually I can't be happy until that happens. And, and that's where the retreat started effectively, right? So, uh, so, so we, we deal with the mind. It's the mind and body detox, essentially, although detox could be the wrong word, but we, we, we address the mind. And no other place had done the two combined at the time. I mean, no one, I tried to look around for a retreat that I would want to go on. I'd had a boot camp where people would just wake you up at four in the morning calling you fat, fatty and making you cry. Um, or you had the other, was just a yogi, nom your ringi, or, uh, which was enough to make me just slice my leg off because that, because that for a week, no, but that's me personally, that for, but having the balance of the two throughout the week has worked phenomenally well. And then it took many, many years before, obviously I built my own, but that, that was massive risk. But I mean, we're not, we're not even real. I mean, it's ridiculous. We didn't have the money to build the frigging retreat. It was absolutely insane. But you know what? You know, the biggest risks have the biggest rewards, you know, those that say, because what's the worst thing that can happen? What is the, as long as you've got your health, as long as you, and that's the, listen, as long as you, health is wealth, as corny as it is. And I tell you now, as long as you have your health and you feel sharp and you can run around and you can do this, it doesn't, the rest is gravy. We come with nothing. We leave with nothing. The rest is gravy. And Uh, that's, that's, so to me, there was no risk involved as such. The only risk would be, well, I might end up in Packham again, painting and decorating. But, you know, I'll start again. <laughs> if you're interested in watching the video content of this interview and many others, or interested in learning from world leaders and teachers, go to www.thebestyou.online. Listen, I mean, I think kind of what you built, obviously, you know, with these phenomenal retreats with obviously international celebrity stars from all over the world attending. I mean, you know, you, you, you've attracted so many great people and obviously helped and transformed them. Into but listen, I think it's good to listen. I think it's good to vision. I, I was never really a vision. I wasn't a real fan of Napoleon Hill, 1953, whatever the mind can believe and conceive it can achieve. I know I should be. I'm into personal development and I know a lot of people are. I never really... It kind of, t- I'm not airy fairy. I didn't really believe in it, but I'm starting to question because it seems to happen. So, so, I'm, so I'm like, actually, there might be something in it because silly things like we used to always finish the week when we used to just hire these places for like two weeks a year, four weeks a year, six weeks a year as we developed, and we used to finish the week on trampolines. We'd take that, doing never forget, right? That's how we always finished it and jumped in the in the sea or the river or whatever. Little did I, and then I always visualized, well, wouldn't it be nice if Gary Barlow is here. Wouldn't it be nice, you know, doing the thing? And then roll on years later, the guy locks down our entire retreat, brings some spy skills with him, brings, <laughs> brings some other celebrities with him that nearly brought David Schwimmer, who's one of the Friends guys, you know, and this, that, and the other. And I'm there and he comes along and I'm doing rebounding at the end and he's doing Never Forget. And I said when I built Juicy Oasis, I said, this is going to be the place, the most so- I want it to be the most sought after retreat in Europe. We're building another one now and it'll be the last one I build. People say, why don't you build them everywhere? Because I don't want to be the McDonald's of retreats. That's why I, I, this is a, there's an important part of the retreat plays in my own life as well. So I just want to make sure that I, I get to experience these playgrounds. So the one we're building, Juicy Escape, is, um, is it's called Europe's Healthiest Playground. And I just, I cannot even tell you how, not only excited I am, but how visual I am. So we've got a football pitch there. We've got a, a military assault course. We're going to have, when you come out of your room, which is a pod over a lake, there's going to be a slide. So you wake up straight down the slide in the lake. This, that, there's just fun everywhere. But I visualize playing football with David Beckham, <laughs> right? <laughs> Tell you, you got to visualize David Beckham, Robbie Williams, and Rod Stewart at the same time. <laughs> right, we're having a knockabout. And I only want David there anyway. David, like I know him. The way I say, I only want David there. I don't yeah. ever met him. But I only want David Beckham there so that I can make a smoothie with him in order to blend it like Beckham. Come yeah. on, people. <laughs> Come on, that's what we're talking about. 
I love it. I love it. I love it. But listen, I know you're quite com- competitive. Don't, don't tackle him, okay? I mean, like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I think you I think you destroy I'm very I'm fe- do you know what one of the many flaws that I have and I I think all flaws also have a reward at the same time but I'm so competitive though yeah Hon- I- honestly, honestly like fit, but you know when I get on a volleyball court or whatever I see I always say to people look don't judge me on this next half an hour. <laughs> this isn't really me. I will apologize afterwards. Yeah, I just, yeah. I yeah. just have to have to win. Somebody said the other day, and I was joking, but kind of. A, they said, you know, they said, you, you know, are you a bad loser? I said, I don't know. I said, as soon as it happens, I'll let you know. But yeah. it was, a, it was, a, it was a joke, obviously. You know what I mean? But I just thought, there's no way I'm losing. Yeah, but listen, let me. I'm just telling. You, I'll apologize later, but you're going down, and uh, that's what I'm telling you. <laughs> but listen, uh, look. Um, I, in, in your mind, in my mind, there's no doubt that you've obviously been visual because at the end of the day, when 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 that person triggered that, asked you that question, boom, it was in your head and all of a sudden it became a reality. Every, Absolutely. Yeah. Everything is visualized. But Correct. you've obviously had big pictures in your mind and, and, and I love I love how kind of like at the end of the day, and it is, I mean, it, it is, but, but it's the fact, you know, we spend our life building or trying to build wealth uh, to then, you know, find our health and then, health is the most important wealth. I think, that, I think the best thing, do you know what, Bernardo, I think, you know, just having this conversation, now, I think the best thing I think that we've ever produced, that we've ever put together, um, is the documentary Sue Produced Me. And, and that's for two reasons. One, I think it's had without question the most impact. Two, it's free for people, which was always something that I wanted to do, but it's easier said than done if you've got no money. Once you start to develop a little bit of money, you can actually plow it back in for the greater good. That's the whole idea, mm. is to keep the archery of money going. Otherwise, it doesn't work. You've got to keep, the more you have, the more you give. Otherwise, you're, you're in trouble. You have to do that um, uh, if you want it to continue. And I saw Sue Produce Me as a vocation, as almost a, a memory to my mom, as corny as that is, you know, and, and it's that one of those, here you go, mom, this is, I hope, I hope this makes you proud. Uh, so sadly, she's not with us anymore. And, and the documentary has been seen by 6 million people now. I mean, Richard Branson even put it on his airplanes. And I remember one of the golden moments that I had was being in Virgin Upper Class. I was very fortunate to be up there. And uh, it was mainly points, just to point out to people what they start <laughs> think I'm showing off. Um, but I was in Virgin Upper Class, and I remember one of these moments. I forgot that Virgin had taken my movie. I got out of Vera, which is their in, in-flight entertainment yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. And I opened it up, and there was, my, there was my movie. And we have certain moments in our life, like the Gary Barlow on the trampoline moment, uh, and like in the future moments, like when David Beckham's kicking a ball at Juicy Escape. Uh, so I can already see that, like you said, visualize. Um, but actually seeing your own movie, seeing your own movie, when actually I'm not a documentary filmmaker, and that's another thing. Anybody wants to do anything out there, as corny as it is, you, you do it. And ironically, the less research you do on it, I know this is the opposite to most people say, I'd say the better. I said, because otherwise what you do is you get yourself down a dark hole of how it should be done. Well, they did it like this, so I'll do it like that. No, forget everybody else. Forget what are you even thinking about? If you've got an idea, act like a kid. Don't worry, you didn't, as a kid, you didn't, when you started building something, you didn't go, I want to see how all the other kids have made their little paper houses. You didn't freaking look around at that. You just went, I've got an idea and I want it to be unique and I want it to be different. Moreover, I want it to be me, authentically me. And that's why the documentary, we had an Odeon Leicester Square premiere with an orange carpet. Insane. People went, how did you get a Odeon Leicester Square, West End London premiere? I said, we just hire it. It's not cheap. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there's ways to get everything, but yeah. we, we're going to, we're going to be filming Super Produce Me too, to okay. finally put, and it's actually called, it's, it's just called First Do No Harm, uh, which is the, and I'll tell you what's led us to this as well. It's just what's going on at the moment as we're recording this, depending on when people are listening to this, uh, but COVID-19 is very much in the thick of it as we're recording this yeah. and, uh, and, and the whole premise behind uh, Super Produce Me too is First Do No Harm, just mainly on drugs, but the current, system that we have at the moment if the uh if the uh disease essentially is is is, is covid the, the treatment is locked down um but the side effects haven't been assessed which is the only time i think ever i can imagine a treatment being so heavily implemented globally which is that's what it is the treatment for this is lockdown because yeah. uh, they don't have a treatment so they but but the ultimate side effects of this i i, I dread to think but that's another subject altogether no and and, and i wanted to was i understand precious of your time here, Jason, but I do want to ask you very briefly about that, obviously, because, you know, you pointed out, and I remember one of the times we spoke about, you know, the NHS, and obviously, you know, how can, you know, don't ask what the NHS 
can do for you, what can you do for the NHS? Obviously, one of the things that I've been talking with a lot of the people that I've been interviewing uh, is obviously, guys, you know, if, if you eat crap, if you don't exercise, um, if you've got a really, really bad immune system, yes, you know, it's going to be more challenging for you, you know, but it's it's so important. And, and, and I get it that people get it, but they don't understand it. They don't. Yeah, but the, 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 the strangest thing that we have right now, Bernardo, though, is that you're not even allowed to mention it. I mean, you've said there that you've mentioned it, but you start mentioning it, people then go into the quackery land, yeah. sensing that you are so down the alternative route and you, what you're doing is... I saw somebody yeah. online the other day recommending drinking, essentially, what is a bleach product as a way of definitely killing COVID-19. I mean, that that is so ill-informed and it's also the wrong thing to be doing and so on. But the challenge you've got is that the minute anybody mentions nutrition even, you get put in the same box which is beyond frustrating. Mm-hmm. And we know that how detrimental it is on the whole for people of a certain age because their immune system is weaker. That's the yeah. premise of it. That's the point. And for underlying health conditions, which means their immune system is weaker. That is the entire point. Now, I'm not saying that it's anybody, it's their fault or they should, not in the slightest. And I'm also not saying that there are some people who with a very healthy immune system can indiscriminately be shot down with it, right? Of course, yeah. far from it, uh, is anybody saying that, or that this is like normal flu, it's incredibly potent. What I would argue heavily though, is I don't understand, this could come out to bite me, I appreciate, we, listen, hindsight's always great. We're not in hindsight, we're in the thick of it. Yeah. And what I don't understand, I said it from the very beginning, I, I don't understand if it affects primarily people with the underlying health condition and those of a certain age, why have we effectively quarantined the world of every age as opposed to why didn't we go, right, here's what we'll do is that we will effectively quarantine those guys, everybody else, get out there, work your socks off and let's look after these guys. We've got a two-pronged attack. We'll look after the economy. We'll get things moving. We'll keep things moving rather. And why don't you guys, we'll, we'll do anything. How much, first of all, economically, how much more value would, would everybody get? They would have had better care. There'd be less risk. They, I just don't understand it. It's also now coming out clearly that being outside, the chances of actually getting outside. I'm speaking to you from Spain. I tell you where I'm right now. I'm in Spain, my little son, right? And, and you can't make this up. You can take a dog out for a walk here. You can't take your son out for a walk. I know. It's absolute Ch- madness. Ch- children have been effectively locked up for five weeks at, uh, as, as we're speaking, five weeks, but locked up, not allowed out. And the vast majority don't have outside space. Yeah. You're in a flat. They're in this. And although people, there's very emotive going, well, what else? This is what we need to do because, you know, otherwise you're going to be killing people. I mean, it's very emotive, incredibly emotive and a very knee-jerk reaction. And, and, and I don't know how they've managed to get so many people kind of on board with the agenda so quickly. And this isn't not treating it well. I mean, at the moment, as we're currently speaking, it will come out next year, I'm sure. But the ones that have locked down, the ones that haven't locked down, the ones that have gone in between your lockdown, there's a curve in all of them. And there's going to be a curve in it. it I don't, it's just, I don't know whether this is the right approach or not. I'm clearly not a virologist um, or anything else. But the side effects of lockdown, I just imagine them to be with the loss of businesses, the huge unemployment, the, the depression, the suicides. Old people here in Spain that rely on going for a walk, they can't go for a walk. They've already said that going for a walk every day reduces your risk of heart disease, health, and they're telling you for health reasons that you can't do it now. It just doesn't make any sense. So to say this out loud, obviously I'm not going to be chastised by a lot of people because they, well, that means you don't care. Far from it. Look, technically I'm nearly 51. So I'm, I'm technically in a different bracket as well. So technically I'm, I'm in the slightly older bracket. I'm not coming from the 40 or, or younger group to saying, well, it doesn't affect us. So I don't care. What I'm saying is, is that I just don't think, and, and, and by the way, there's a premise on this too is that I, I don't envy any government right now. What I, what I find extraordinary is that governments have to make a decision. Whether they make the right or wrong decisions, that will be seen in the future so no one really knows. So it's easy, very easy for someone like me to say something as I've just been doing. Yeah. They've, they're, they're, they're making decisions. And I, and I am genuinely more than happy to go along with those decisions because somebody has to make them, right? So somebody has to put their balls on the line and make a decision that they think is best. And I think the intent, their intent, is, is that's what it is. They think that they leave, they're listening to the science and they're just going, well, this is what we think. That could, for whatever reason, come back and bite them. What I don't like is, is Twitter land, the keyboard warriors. Everyone's an expert. Everyone's a virulent. And, and they're attacking 
The yeah. go- it doesn't matter who the government are. It's such an easy shot. They should have had PPE sooner. They should have had... The- and and a lot of these people that are on their keyboards arguing and getting angry and everything else, what's their, what's their task for the day? Mainly to wake up and go and watch Netflix and go and grab some food. Yeah. And they're picking on the people that are barely getting three or four hours sleep under all this pressure. So immune system, to come back to where we started with this without it being political, what we've learned from this, I think, as you just mentioned, is how important the immune system is. Uh-huh. And, and I just think that a lot of people will start to understand that actually they can do a great deal. So I like to, to come full circle, ask not what the NHS can do for you, but what you can do for the NHS in every way. Mm-hmm. Don't make random, I'll tell you what this has done, this has shown people um, every uh-huh. Thursday... Every Thursday, well, every Thursday they're giving a round of applause for, for, for nurses and doctors and everything else. But we should have been doing that anyway. Nothing, I'm not saying nothing's changed for them. They're in the front line. But they have always worked this hard. They have always been under the cosh, always had 12, 14-hour shifts, always been. Yeah, I mean, these, these, are all, these have always been heroes working because of the love of it and because of the care of it. And I just think we all play a part now. It's at the breaking point. Forget COVID-19, it was a breaking point beforehand. It just generally is yeah. because it's being misused by so many people. And I think the ones that stop misusing it and walk away from it and try and think, well, actually, what can I do for it a little bit? Then that will, that will ease the, the, the burden uh, on the NHS. I think more than anything else that we can do is to ask ourselves, look, uh, do I have a responsibility to stay in shape? Do I have a responsibility to eat healthily? Yeah. I mean, where's my responsibility in all of this? And that doesn't mean that you, you won't get sick. I mean, I want to get clear here as well. That doesn't mean you might not get cancer. It's indiscriminate. But it just means at least arm yourself a little bit and give yourself a fighting chance. That's all I'm saying. No, absolutely. And, and, and that's kind of it. That, that's it. Is, is we, have, we all have that responsibility. Uh, Jason, I, want to add, I wanted to end uh, kind of what's next uh, for you. Now, you mentioned obviously about the new documentary and, uh, and you've got, you know, well, you, what's, what's next? The new, it's the new documentary and the new retreat. Those two go yeah. hand in hand. Okay. We're filming the new documentary at the retreat. Oh. So, so they effectively go hand in hand. So the minute lockdown has come to an end, I mean, you've got to bear in mind our retreats business has just gone overnight. It's completely gone. I mean, it's just, that's it. People aren't allowed to travel um, and so on. So um, the irony of a health retreat having to close for health reasons hasn't been lost on me. Um, but anyway, but, it, but, 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 but that's how it is. And, and I genuinely do respect the decisions that have been made. I mean, I know I sound like I haven't. These were just my own, I suppose, knee-jerk reactions to. So, but, but, but anyway, you're so, right. You're right. A lot, of it, a lot of it is questionable and, and quite right. You know, that's all a lot it of is. It doesn't but, make any sense. But at the same time, somebody has to make a decision. But yeah, so these are the things for me. So yeah, building the, the new retreat, um, which is on hold at the moment, uh, and then doing the new documentary. But we're already coming up with, and I'm actually writing, as I speak to you, I'm writing the, uh, the new plan, so, um, which is the juice and blend plan. So which is uh, just literally 20 years worth of the best juices I've ever had, 20 years of the best blends I've ever had, combining them together to make what I call the ultimate plan so that you know, blends are more satisfying than juices. So therefore actually, and you don't have to use, clean your juicer as much. So is there, you know, um, so that's, that's what I'm doing there. That's, that'll come out in September. Um, and then there's tons of other products. As always, Bernardo, you know, anybody that, that does this kind of stuff, the stuff that we do, you never switch off. You know, we get told off by our partners often, why don't you stop working? You go, cause I'm not working. Yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> because that's like saying, well, why don't you stop playing tennis? Yes. You know, it's the same thing. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's a ridiculous I statement. I, I'm well, not working. I, I, I love, love, love doing what, what, what I do. And yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, I haven't done any, I just haven't had time to do any like live talks or anything else, but that might be something else that I might look at next year or something. Like that. Well, listen, I'm, um, I, I love your work. I love what you do. Um, congratulations on everything. Well done. Uh, Thanks, very proud. You should be very proud of yourself. Thank Appreciate you so much, Jason. And stay safe. Uh, Take care. All the best. Cheers, man. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.